I believe personally, it's a personal conviction of mine that the church should be a place of excellence. And if we're banking on a whole team that is an entry level leaders, you're gonna get entry level production. So if you wanna be a person who is effective, you wanna have a team that's effective, help people get the right people on the bus. Once they're on the bus, we can figure out roles. A lot of people in your church are on the sidelines or maybe they're even on team, but they're not bought in. What you're, what you're having is a bunch of renters. They're just renters of borrowed vision from you and you can't live off a of borrowed vision. If we get 1% better every Sunday, imagine what your church would look like in 52 weeks. Hey everyone, welcome to this week's conversation. I'm excited to jump in to this concept or conversation around mediocrity. I believe this is a very aggressive word that I think if we can actually get to the pinpoint of why do we feel like this and why are there things and signs inside the local church that quite honestly, we're not at the level of excellence that we should be at. I believe personally, it's a personal conviction of mine that the church should be a place of excellence. All throughout scripture, whenever God talks about the place that the Christians or people would gather, it would always be super specific details. And every single time God does anything, he is a God of excellence. And to be honest, I don't think mediocrity is attractive. I don't think there are people in our cities who are looking for a subpar experience, a subpar worship team, a subpar back inside of things. When you're when you're attracting people who are leaders inside of the church, they're saying, hey, I really wanna make a difference inside of your church. What they're gonna be looking at, one sure is the mission, vision, values, which are a part of what we're gonna talk about, but more lines, why churches fail is they don't hold their volunteers to a standard. And if they can't meet the standard, we got to be able to have a conversation and hold them to something because I don't know about you, but I wanna be a part of a winning team. I wanna be a part of a team that's making a difference. And how we do that in the best case scenario is we set up our teams, our leadership structures, all of that up for success. So let's just jump into it. I have eight points here. Hopefully this won't be super mundane for you. I truly believe there's a ton of value in this. This isn't anything that I've uh, come up with myself. These are just things that over my journey of leading in the last 10 years in the church, really writing things down and taking good notes uh, in any experience I walk into. So this isn't about one specific church. This isn't about one specific idea or person. These are all just observations that I've made on my journey that I believe separate good experiences, good services, good leadership teams, and great leadership teams. Number one, quick to give titles, but slow to delegate responsibilities. You default to dumping. I don't know about you, but I hate getting dumped on. I hate massive concepts or massive things without slow de delegation. And we need to learn that titles actually carry zero weight. What carries weight is the one anointing and number two authority, which produces influence. You don't have influence without anointing. You don't have influence without authority. That happens one, when a person is more focused on filling roles and filling positions than helping people grow into the person they're supposed to be. And again, more of these things are not, not super specific when it comes to this episode. These are all more philosophical things that will help you drive to practical size of church because there's obviously a practical side of this that's talking about all of the things that we can, we can talk through, but more lines, if we don't hit the, it, we don't hit the heart, we don't hit the why behind why we should be a place of excellence, why we should care if our church or our, our structures are, are mediocre at best. Uh, and again, like I said, you, you just can't be quick to give out titles. There are people who are hungry for opportunity and hungry for position, but we know position is the entry level. And if we're banking on a whole team that is an entry level leaders, you're gonna get entry level production. And we really can't have that. We gotta make sure that if we're gonna be who we say we are, we're gonna have to make sure people are living in roles before they have titles. 
You're quick, you're quick to give a title. What's going to end up happening is you're going to be six months in and they're not going to be living in that place. And you're going to be frustrated because you gave them a title and you didn't have uh, any patterns. We've talked about that in another episode. And man, man we, don't, we don't follow potential. We follow patterns. We don't give off of potential. We don't give titles or authority off of the potential of it. We give it off of patterns. Men, they're living in it. They're a person who's a, above reproach. They're a person who treats their family great. Their wife or spouse is very confident. Those are the things that I'm looking for. And I, and I pray that you also are looking for those as well. So you're quick to give titles. You may be in a, in a mediocre experience. And I, and I pray that throughout this next 30 minutes, you'll be challenged and produce change. So be slow to de delegate responsibilities. No, you should not. You should be quick to delegate responsibility, but do not dump on them. Don't give them everything. And don't give them the bad things, by the way. We do such a bad job of delegating. We delegate all the things we don't want to do. How about you delegate the great things? Delegate the things that are fun. Dele delegate the things that you would want to be delegated to. So don't be, don't be quick to give titles and be quick to delegate responsibility to people because then they can take ownership, which we'll talk about at the very end. But again, don't be quick to give titles. Number two, excellence is talked about, but not a reality. Excellence is like the word that every church uses, every business uses. It's a thing that we all can't put our tongue on or can't focus on when we're like, man, I, I think I want to have an experience that's excellent. I want to have a worship team that's excellent. I want to have a church that's excellent. I want to have a business that's excellent. But you got to be able, to, one, to just define all the things we're talking through here. But excellence speaks. X and excellence speaks louder than you think. Because when you don't have it, it is very loud. And when you do have it, it's very loud as well. So what type of loud do you want? What type of noise do you want to make in your city? Because the reality is, is a lot of churches and a lot of leaders talk about excellence. But one, they don't live a life of excellence. So then their team all has the reproduced bad version of excellence. Because by the way, core values in your church or core values in your team, those are all things that are not, not targets. And we'll talk about that in a bit, but those aren't targets. Those aren't things that we're aiming for. Values are the things that we live. Those are convictions that we have not chasing for. So if you have a value of excellence, that's not something that we're striving for. That is something that we're living in. You live a life of excellence. You are, I, have a, I have a friend named Sweb, and he always says on, in interviews, like, do you feel like you're living a life of excellence? And they'll say, oh, yeah, I think I do a pretty okay job. He's like, great, let's go see your car then. Let's go see your car. Open your back seat. What does it look like? That in itself will reflect whether you are a person, and I get it, there's circumstances and all that stuff, but none of that is an excuse to not live a life of excellence. Excellence has three buckets, and you've heard this plenty of times in church that I actually think makes a very, very simple. We've talked about it, and, and two churches ago, my wife and I were a part of an incredible church in Omaha called My City. We're part of the church plant and then the downtown campus and all of that. But one of our core values was excellence. And really, the three buckets is on time, engaged, prepared. So if you think about those three buckets, rank, rank your team, rank your individual leaders, rank yourself on those out of 10. Am I on time? Like, am I actually on time? Which by the way, for leaders, that means you're early because you're setting the standard. Am I on time? Am I engaged? So when I'm there, am I there? Am I, am I where my feet are at? But also online on Slack or whatever communication platform you use. Like, how is my engagement with our team? Are, are the people reacting to emo with emojis? Are they threading? Are they texting back? Are they emailing back? Are they confirming or declining on planning center? All that's engagement. And what that's saying is, man, my team is engaged and we're living a t in unity with excellence and prepared. Do I show up prepared? By the way, if you, if you haven't been communicating for 30 years, even people who have communicated for 30 years will tell you they still come prepared. They come with an idea. They come with a a concept or something that they're going to be talking through, that shows I care about you because I'm prepared. Imagine if that's equal to a worship team not practicing the whole week. They just show up and have no clue idea what the lyrics are, no idea what key they're playing in, and they just hope they sound good. That's what a lot of communicators sound like on Sundays. A lot of MCs sound like they just they just show up and they just think that, that God's going to speak through them. 
But most of the time in my experience, and even my friends who are three times my age, any time that God speaks, it's through a lens of preparation. You've prayed through it. You've processed through it. You've read the Bible and read commentaries on the concept of what you're going to be communicating to. Or if you're praying for something, man, I'm going to sit in it before I ever pray out loud in a group because the reality is is I want my heart and my spirit prepared for what I'm going to do because we know heart produces heart, mind produces mind, spirit produces spirit. So if if I want to impact somebody's spirit, I need to have my spirit prepared. That shows I, our team and myself, we have a spirit of excellence. Excellence is a spirit. Everything we do has a spirit attached to it and a culture. So excellence speaks louder than you think. Let's be a church. Let's be, and again, all these, if you look through the lens of excellence, it's all about excellence. Excellence is the medicine that will, that will transfer mediocrity into attractiveness and growth, in my opinion, anyways. So excellence speaks louder than you think. Number three, systems aren't a priority. Systems matter because they create behaviors and behaviors become habits. Habits drive outcomes. If you have specific outcomes you want to reach as a team, as a church, look at the systems you have in place to achieve them. We had our we had our team night last night, so much fun, 50 incredible people who are joining launch team for our church in Phoenix. And it's just so fun. I got to share a little bit at the end of the systems we're using as a team because we got to obviously get people onboarded to those systems. And our lead pastor, I love him so much. He said, man, Josh is a big spreadsheets guy. Josh is that the the back end side of things. He loves all that stuff. And I got up and jokingly, I was like, I really don't love that stuff. I'm not a spreadsheet guy. I'm not a, I'm not a, I don't like that stuff. But what I do like is what it drives. Because I, 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 I know what it's attached to. If we can attach systems to the outcomes, because there really is a clear linear path here, if you want to have great reach, if you want to have great potential and impact in your city, pinpoint back to the systems that your team has agreed upon. And I promise you that will point to the future. Again, this speaks to excellence. Excellence and systems is probably the same word, to be honest, because a system is not just an app. A system is a thing that we're all saying yes to. Do you have SLPs? Do you have position descriptions? Do you have clarity on what a team does? Is there a definition to what the welcome team is, what the host team is, what the ushers are? What the, if you have definitions, people don't have room to wander and make it their own because we don't want 50 people in our churches doing their own thing. What that is, is that's 50 different churches because we're again, we have a clear vision, which we'll talk about in a moment, but the reality is, is man, we got to make sure systems are a priority. Systems deliver the mission. Ideation is the easiest part. Execution's the hard part. You want to you have great ideas. You want to have great vision, which is in two points. We'll talk about it. Vision's great. Implementation is the hard part. It, and when it really, it shouldn't be the hard part because we can pinpoint it back to the results. So, Make sure systems are a priority. Number four, groups and teams are propaganda, not conviction. It shouldn't feel forced to get people to serve in your church or attend a group or have leaders lead a group or leaders attend a team, like team nights, all that stuff. What I'm trying to say is you shouldn't constantly have to be selling the same people the same things that they already said yes to. Have Make it clear, have them say yes to your expectations for them. And then you shouldn't have to sell it to them every single week or every single month when you have a team night. Hey, man, I really need to, can you sign up for this? Hey, man, I really, at that point, you're just babysitting. And, and I don't know about you, but I, I don't want to babysit adults. More than that, I don't want to babysit Christians. I don't want to chase Christians. You're already going to heaven. You have the same Holy Spirit that lives inside of me who rose Christ from the dead. So if he can raise Christ from the dead, if he can raise people and he can heal people and make blind people see, man, I promise you, there's got to be some conviction in your heart to serve, to be all in, to say, to say yes to things that you can say yes to and say no to the things that you can have to say no to. That's okay. The point is have expectations, make it simple, and stop chasing people. It should not feel like propaganda. We shouldn't have to force people into these things because a great product doesn't need marketing. A great service, by the way, doesn't need marketing. Not a church service. It doesn't need marketing. And that's from Peter Thiel, not the Bible. 
But in my opinion, it's so true. Like you shouldn't need to market what God's doing because if God's truly doing something through your team and through you, there there is so much attractiveness to that that is the opposite of mediocrity. If you think about Acts 2, when the church really launched, when there was a spectacular experience in the upper room and, and Peter's preaching a couple of days really after he denied Christ and he's up there preaching, 42, verse 42 through 47 talks about how the Lord added to their numbers daily. What that's going back to, they didn't have a sales method. They didn't have a marketing strategy. What they had was the Holy Spirit and he was driving like no other, because why? They had unity and vision. They were spending time together. They were being generous. And you can truly pinpoint a person's salvation. And I'm not saying this proves somebody's salvation, but there is a reality to generosity is the only thing that we can do after we understand how generous God has been to us through salvation. God's, it's been a gift that we were grafted in the body of Christ. We are, we are grafted in to the vine, now we're a branch, okay? So a branch bears fruit, it makes grapes. So if we're not making grapes, we're not producing fruit, we gotta go back to the source to understand, man, maybe I'm trying to force things out of really a point of what is not connected to what Jesus wants to do. And again, that goes back to obedience. Gotta be obedient, all that to say, man, our team's got to have the conviction that teams and groups are not a cool idea. These are these are a reality to us. This is literally how we're going to build disciples. We're going to push forward the kingdom of God in our local church is through groups and teams. Number five, not a clear vision. You mentioned this a couple of times. Not the statements on your wall, by the way. A lot of churches have vision statements on walls, but and zero hearts. The conviction in your team's heart will definitely pinpoint whether or not your vision's clear. God cannot do anything through a visionless leader. There's one thing God will give you, by the way, is vision. You just have to spend time with him. Hours, not minutes, by the way. You can't spend, if you're trying to lead a team, you're trying to lead a church, you're trying to lead a business, spending two minutes a week with God is not gonna, not gonna work. One, for your own self, your own spirit, and then two, your outpouring of what you're producing and others. So we gotta have a we gotta have a clear vision. Clarity is everything when it comes to being a, an effective leader. And again, like I said, it's not the thing on your website. It's not the thing that you you think is cool that we we took from another church or from this church that sounds good. But it's like no, God spoke to me. I feel like God spoke to me about this. And this is conviction. This is where we're going. And by the way, sight is what you see with your eyes open. Vision is what you see with your eyes closed. So get in a room with your team, everyone close their eyes. Does everybody see the same thing? If they don't, you don't have a clear vision. If you do, you have a clear vision and you're heading in the right direction. So we gotta be very clear and we gotta be able to communicate that in an effective way that people can actually see themselves in that vision. If people can see themselves in the vision you're articulating, I promise you, you will 100% make a difference in your city. Number six, hospitality is a team, not a spirit. This grinds my gears. You should not have a hospitality team. You should have a whole team on a Sunday experience or a Wednesday or whatever that carries a spirit of hospitality. If you want to know how Jesus grew his ministry, how in Acts we just talked about how they grew their, their quote unquote church, their growth strategy, it was through hospitality. And again, yes, open up your home. You should not call yourself a pastor of somebody unless they've been in your home. You're not their pastor. You might be their leader. You're definitely not their pastor if they haven't been in your home. Because if we want to model the way Jesus lived, which that's our whole principle, by the way, as pastors, is to, man, all right, I got to help people understand Jesus died and resurrected and lived through his disciples still to this day called the Holy Spirit for really for other people to understand that hospitality is a spirit, which means your worship team they're on the hospitality team. Lead pastor, you're the leader of the hospitality team. Little practical things here, by the way, your worship team should not be in the green room during the message. Your worship team should be in service with their notebooks, taking notes, which shows, goes back to excellence. They're engaged and they're not just, they're not just performing, singing songs, going to the green room, singing songs, going to the green room, 
It's okay to go to a green room, get some coffee, have a snack, but come back out, sit in service, be engaged. It's the same thing if you're preaching and you're not in worship. How weird is that? It doesn't make sense at all. So hospitality is not a team. It's not. You could actually, honestly, and I believe in connections. I think you should have a connections team. More aligns, it's an information hub at that point. But it's like everybody's on the connection team because I need to be connecting with people that I don't know. So hospitality, if you want to have an attractive church, a church that's growing, that people are excited to attend and be a part of, not just guests, not just spectators, but participators, stop putting things in silos like hospitality. Hospitality should be a spirit in your whole church. By the way, your dishes, your knives and forks and spoons should be tarnished by how how much they are used from people coming in your home. If you want to make a difference in your team, in your city, in your church, in your friend group, have people in your home and stop putting on the front that you have it all together. You're the best, like wear normal clothes, wear comfy clothes, wear shorts, wear a t-shirt, put on a cap and just hang out, be a normal human being. And people, I promise you, will follow you way more than you just trying to fake it till you make it. All right, last two here, right people in the wrong seats. Really, this goes back to number one, but man, can we not be married to roles? And the, and the, real, the reality is, is the number one thing that we need to do a better job of is helping people find the right seat that they are graced for. Not gifted in, but graced for. Just because you're a good singer does not mean you should lead worship because you might have a, a toxic spirit that needs to be flushed out. Just because you know how to communicate does not mean you should preach. Just because you can play a guitar does not mean... You can insert any team in, in, in church, but I believe, one, don't be married to your role. That's an idol if you can't give it over to God. Number two, I, us as leaders, put on your leader hat in this podcast. Think about the people that are on your team. They are literally wired one of one. There is no, you can take all the strength finders, Enneagram. I believe in all that stuff. It helps me so much day to day. But the reality is, is everyone is one of one. So if we have a whole team, if we have 200 one of ones, you need to do a great job of discovery of understanding how they're wired. What are they passionate about? What they're excited about? What are they graced for? That happens, by the way, in prayer. God, I promise you, he will speak to you when you pray about your team. God, help me have the vision you have for him to help me drive to what you called him to do. You pray that prayer every day for your whole team with a notebook out and journal what God's speaking to you about the person. I promise you, you will take them farther than any strategy any John Maxwell book will give you. All this stuff's great, by the way. I read every single day. I've read over 30 books this year that are not the Bible. And it's still our responsibility to pray and to seek Jesus to help us see the people that we're leading the way he sees them and where he wants to take them. Because our job as pastors is to not take people where we want them to go. We need to take them where God has graced them to go. The reality is, is we got it. it. It's good to great and dare to lead great books, but it really articulates this concept of man, getting the right people on the bus is way more important than figuring out seats. Once we have the right people on the bus, really, it doesn't matter where we're going. We could, we could plant a church in Phoenix. We could plant a church in New York. We could go to Australia. It doesn't matter where we are, but what really matters is who we're doing it worth with. Rich Wilkerson Jr. always says alignment determines assignment. And I think that's so true. Man, we got to be aligned as a group because that will determine the assignment that's on our life. So if you want to be a person who is effective, you want to have a team that's effective, help people get the right people on the bus. Once they're on the bus, we can figure out roles. I remember a long time ago, there's a really influential church and every six months, they would change positions. They're pastors. The worship pastor would be on operations. The operations pastor would be in facilities. The facilities, they would mix it up because it does not matter. It doesn't matter where you are. What matters is that, man, I'm bought into the mission. I'm bought into the vision. I can make a difference no matter where I am. And yet we still need to help people find where God has graced them and anointed them for this season of their life. Number eight, and this is the last one. This one's kind of going to be the longer one. You might have a team of renters, but not owners. You're producing a lot of people in your church 
are on the sidelines or maybe they're even on team, but they're not bought in, what you're, what you're having is a bunch of renters. Ownership is the hallmark in the calling of your life. You want to live a life that is full of fruit that God's graced you for? Stop living like a renter. Start being an owner. Because when I own something, I care about it a little bit more than I rent. I, my wife and I, we rent a two-bedroom apartment. We have an incredible apartment in downtown Phoenix. We love it so much. And yet, it is not my house. I don't pay a mortgage. I don't mow the lawn. I do take care of it because it's mine and I want to steward it. But I don't own it. And most people like the idea of owning something, but they don't count the cost of what that actually means. Because when you rent something, you just use it. You'll never lead, by the way, what you don't own. So you're wondering, man, why is this team not growing? Why is this team, their spirit or their camaraderie is weird? It's because none of them own the team. None of them act like owners. They're just renters of borrowed vision from you. And you can't live off a of borrowed vision. You can live off a of borrowed vision for probably six months. And you'll get burnt out and go to the next thing because it never truly was yours. It wasn't a personal vision that God spoke to you about your team. So when you rent something, you use it, but you will never lead what you don't own. A leader, by the way, takes ownership. A leader doesn't need permission to own something. They don't need permission to lead. A lion does not need permission to be a lion. I'm a male. I don't need permission to be a male. I was designed to be a male. A leader, you don't need permission to lead. You are a leader. That is something that you are, not something you do. So a leader takes ownership and this all comes back to this. Here's the solution for you, investment. You got to make investments into something you own. Ownership, by the way, is an investment in itself. I, if you own a home, that is one of the greatest investments you can have in the physical space. If you own your team and your church and you're saying, man, God's given this to me, I'm going to act like I own it. And again, we're always open-handed. We're stewards of what we own, but you will dismiss what someone else owns. If something is in your space and you're, again, you're noticing the fruit of something not actually producing positive fruit, it's negative fruit, you gotta ask this question. Is my team renters or are they owners? Because when you step into leadership, it's yours. When the person's got the title, they're living in it, I'm asking you to own this. I'm not asking you to borrow vision that I have. I want you to have vision for your team because God will give vision for the thing that he has graced you for. Because we know this, when I've served somebody, I'm choosing it. When I'm, when I'm living, when I'm showing up on time, that's a choice. When I'm, when I'm practically putting deposits into my team on a daily basis through encouragement, through text messages, that's a choice. That's choosing every day. I'm gonna own what God's given me. And your ability, this is, this is the heart of it, your ability to take ownership is your ability to care. You cannot tell me you care about something and yet you don't act like you own it. If you just rent something, you won't have the level of ownership and attentiveness that you would if you owned it. So what does ownership look like? You gotta look at renters, compare, owners, build. Renters are constantly living in comparison. Man, this person has this, this person has this. Man, they have a bigger house, they have a bigger thing. Their team's more unified. They're, renters compare, owners build. Renters complain about what they don't have. Owners maximize what they've been given. You want to be a renter? If you want to know if you're a renter anyways, look at what your tongue. Your tongue is a portrait of your heart. If you're constantly talking about what you don't have or you're an owner, man, you're maximizing what you've been given. You might have been given five people. That's okay. Are you stewarding that? Are you building that? Are you putting deposits in them. Owners flourish, by the way. If you want to flourish in the calling on your life, live in a life as an owner. Adam and Eve, if you think about it, they were sitting and not owning their space. What they were, they were given something. They were given full access. Don't touch this thing. That's a boundary, by the way. It's a great, a great leader gives people freedom within a framework. Hey, lead this, but don't touch this. That's a boundary. They crossed a boundary which shows they weren't owning it, they were renting it. And again, that's more of the lines, it's pretty far-fetched, but I just wanted to give you a practical illustration there that, man, we as owners will live a life of flourishing if ownership is maximizing what God has given you. So here's three ways you can own 
your team, own your calling, own what you are graced for. Number one, care for your team. Don't tell me you are living a, a graced life, an anointed life, if you're not taking care of the people God's put in your life, because God will always put somebody attached to whatever he's graced you for. Number two, challenge it. Speak up to the things that aren't to the standard that you know we've all agreed upon. A owner speaks to the things because I own it. I don't borrow it. It's not rented. If you own it and I own it, we can have mutual agreement that we're just trying to get everything better. If we get 1% better every Sunday, imagine what your church would look like in 52 weeks. Number three, last one, create with it. You got to have margin in your life as an owner to create. Create vision, create strategy, create systems, create all the things. All the creativity happens through margin. You want to be a great owner, have a life of margin, have a life of rest, work from rest, not for rest. And by the way, this is the question that I'll end, and this will help you truly practically know, am I building owners or am I building renters? Does every team member know the mission? Practically. Hey, not what's our mission statement. What's the mission? What are we trying to achieve here? And again, we don't use people to try to achieve something. We use what we're trying to achieve to build people. That's the difference. I want, I want to build people. Yes. And again, the avenue, the, the road, the highway is what we're trying to achieve. The opposite, a lot of people use people to try to get to what they're achieving. That's how you burn through people. And that's how you have renters. And that's how you have people who fear you. They don't love you and they're not submitted to you. Submission is a choice. And if I want to submit to somebody, you got to be worth being submitted to. Again, does every team member know the mission? I'm going to run through these eight. I hope they're so valuable to you. I believe again, man, we are so close. When every single one of you, if you just practically took one of these eight points and applied it today, your team would grow. There'd be flourishing like no other. Number one, quick to give titles, slow to delegate responsibility. Number two, excellence is talked about, but not a reality. Three, systems aren't a priority. Four, groups and teams are propaganda, not conviction. Number five, you don't have a clear vision. Number six, hospitality is a team, not a spirit. Number seven, right people in the wrong seats. And eight, you have a team of renters, not owners. Thank you so much for listening to this week's conversations episode. We are close to 100. I think you guys are so incredible. I think the world of all of you guys who are serving faithfully every day, day in and doubt, day out to make a difference in your city. I believe, again, if we just get a 1% better every single week, could only imagine what God's going to use in and through you in your city. Thank you so much.